everybody, happy Wednesday. My name is Elise and welcome to my tea table. It's Wednesday, that means it's Constitution Study Group. We're gonna talk about a, uh, you know, this is a topic that I just became aware of uh, just last week uh, and uh, was really shocked with what I learned and I thought this would be a very appropriate topic uh, to bring up at the Constitution Study Group, um, you know, just to bring some clarity about, you know, where our c civility with one another, you know, between the government and between us as individuals, um, intersects with how we take care of our children. We're talking about child support today, which child support is a federally regulated concept uh, that is um, regulated by the Department of Justice and each state is given you know their own autonomy about how they execute the child child support program but generally uh, this is how it applies all around the country and uh, once you start diving into this subject and, and learning about all of its intricacies uh, you start to see you know have the ability to, to ask the question, is this uh, really as, as civilized as, as we may think? And in and, and this context, of course, civility is our capacity for politeness with one another. Um, and throughout the, the past year plus of conducting these Constitution Study Groups, which I am not a teacher on, I am not a civics teacher, I am not an expert, on the subject, I am learning. This is a co-learning experience. Um, yeah, what, what I've realized over the past year is that our constitution and, and simply any constitution around the world is simply our code, our protocol of civility, our protocol of politeness with one another. So before I get started, uh, I'm gonna drink some tea. Of course, gotta get gotta get nice and uh, theanine up before we uh, we dive deep into this uh, very intense subject. You know, and, and, and it's intense on all sides, um, and we'll see why. You know, this is not a one-sided subject. This is not a easy subject. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of very complex, kind of heavy concepts uh, that we'll we'll be thinking about. Um, and, and thinking about child support. Uh, so, you know, before we get into that and before I drink tea, I do welcome you all, of course, to say hello, let us know how you're doing. But, of course, uh, I, I do welcome any questions or any comments, even initial comments that you may have about already pre established ideas and thoughts you have around what child support is. Uh, and, uh, of course, if you have a first hand story, uh, about your experience with child support, either as a child or as a custodial or non-custodial uh, parent, uh, and you feel safe uh, in this vulnerable space to share as a co-learning experience, please, you are welcome. You are welcome to share your experiences. And just like I said, there are a lot of different angles, a lot of different sides to this concept. It's not one-sided. Uh, there's not one right or wrong answer as we will very soon learn as we start diving into these articles. As always, music provided by our dear friend Justin Sojourner. I know this is gonna be backwards for all y'alls. But Sojourner, he's based here in Las Vegas. You know, I try, I've been trying to play with some new music and it's just frustrating finding finding music that that is good and then you know also ethical and available uh, to be using on these live streams. So Justin has been gracious enough to allow me uh, consent uh, for us to enjoy his um, his music while we uh, we sit at the tea table and drink tea. my tea out just yet. I'll get it out. Just gonna warm everything up, get everything ready and primed for the grand brewing. Let's see. What to drink? I was thinking 
I should have some green tea. Because I've been drinking things other than green tea. Actually, I'm going to drink something that's not tea. I'm going to drink... This is uh, Joe's tea. This is an herbal blend. Hopefully it won't heat me up. Yeah, it should be a pretty cool, cool blend. Our, our, our good friend Joe from Cedar and Sage Herbal. Sage and Cedar Herbal Wellness out of South Dakota. He sources a lot of the herbs. Uh, and he also sources tea. That's how he's friends with us. He sources tea through our network. Uh, but he also sources a lot of the different herbs and ingredients that he works with uh, from local farms uh, in his area there in the Midwest in South Dakota. This blend, this is a blend, it looks like of uh, chamomile, looks like some um, basil. I mean, I could just read the package, it's probably the best. <laughs> Get it completely accurate for you all. Um, oh, so it's cedar, California poppy, passion flower, chamomile, and peppermint. I thought it was actually cedar, interesting. The California poppy, okay, so and this is called slumber. Maybe it'll put me to sleep. I don't think it'll put me to sleep, but you know, I think it'll definitely like relax my mood. It smells great. Very calming kind of aroma to it. Vegas, we got a little bit of cloud coverage blocking out the sun, giving us some relief. Uh, but I'm here in my warehouse, which only has uh, a swamp cooler, uh, so I, I don't have um, air conditioning back here, which is going to become problematic in the next month or so as we reach plus 100 degree days every day. Um, so I'll have to figure that out. Either bring bring some more uh, fans back here or uh, move my studio back in, which I just did all this work to move my studio here to have more space so that we could have uh, more activities and different guests come in, different musical guests and artists come in. Um, I don't know, we'll, we'll go with the flow and, and make it happen. Whatever needs to happen will happen. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and just drink this water that was used to warm all the wares. No need to waste any water. I'm going to turn down this super high energy music a little bit. Put it in the background. A little background music. Alright, so we should be steeped. The, the pieces in this tea are per, quite small, so I'm going to be using my my filter so that um, I don't get any into my brewed tea that I'll be drinking. Although it probably wouldn't be the end of the world if that happened because I'm quite sure that Joe is only working with organic farmers and organic ingredients. So yes, this is not tea technically, it is a, an herbal infusion, a tea saying. But it's cool. We're drinking tea. This is the tea table. We're allowed to call it tea. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> Good to see you, Jenny. Thanks for coming in to saying hello. Uh, we're talking about child support today. We're talking about how, um, you know, the government has placed in codes of civility of how we take care of our children, ensure their well-being, um, which is great. Uh, but there is a lot more to it uh, that I just discovered last week. So 
if you're curious at all about the child support system and, and you know how the, the, the federal government gets involved in that and regulates that, stick around. I'm just drinking some tea. I'm actually drinking uh, an herbal blend that one of our clients in South Dakota uh, puts together. So this is cedar, um, peppermint, chamomile, Flower and California poppy. I got a little poppy in here, so hopefully I don't get any drug tests. So they'll be uh, <laughs> detecting <laughs> that the, the opium in my system. <laughs> so not tea, just enjoying a nice herbal. Mmm. I'm gonna have cookie chai. That's great. Nice cooling tea. I was actually thinking I should have green tea because I'm in my warehouse now and it's quite warm back here. So you know I keep making the mistake of choosing warming teas to drink while doing the streaming um, and so I end up like breaking up into a crazy sweat in the middle of the stream and there's really nothing I could do about it other than just sweat it out um, so I was like oh, I should do green tea but then I saw this tea and I thought you know what this will be fine it's got peppermint I think peppermint is a cooling a cooling herb um, it's certainly delicious I'm, I'm grateful that I, I chose it Another negative of being back in the warehouse is that there's like a landscaping company just on the other side in the, the back alley of the warehouse row that I'm in. Um, and it always seems to be when I stream, they bring out their, their leaf blowers and stuff because they come and drop off all of their cuttings from their, their jobs throughout the day. Um, <laughs> worst things could happen though. I think we're fine. I think we're fine. All right, so with no further ado, I am gonna jump right into this very hairy, serious topic of child support. Um, you know, I hear a lot of opinions about, um, you know, particularly around the welfare system for, for children and families. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's, 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 let's learn, figure out what's going on here. Uh, you know, what is so controversial uh, and perhaps, you know, maybe make some solid assessments for our own lives and our own communities about how we can better advocate not only for children, but also for the, the families, the parents uh, of children uh, that are in need. So currently I am at the, the US Department of Justice website. So this is a, a program that is regulated by uh, the, the Department of Justice, which is a part of the Constitution. So there is constitutionality related to this topic. Uh, and that's why I want to start here. So uh, it says uh, the, the, the part of regulation 18 USC 228 failure to pay legal child support obligations. Section 228 of Title 18 US, US Code makes it illegal for an individual to willfully fail to pay child support in certain circumstances. For one, an individual is subject to federal prosecution if he or she willingly fails to pay child support that has been ordered by a court for a child who lives in another state, or if the payment is passed due for longer than one year or exceeds the amount of $5,000. A violation of this law is criminal misdemeanor and convicted offender face fines and up to six months in prison. All right, so that's just the consequence. That's just laying out, like, what are the consequences of child support? We will go deeper into understanding how the court orders child support and how that's all figured out. If under the same circumstances, the child support payment is overdue for longer than two years or the amount exceeds $10,000, the violation is a criminal felony and convicted offenders face fines and up to two years in prison. Lastly, this statute prohibits individuals obligated to pay child support from crossing state lines or fleeing the country with the intent to avoid paying child support that has either been passed due for more than one year or exceeds $5,000. Any individual convicted of this crime may face up to two years in prison. Notably, other than in specific circumstances, aforementioned child support enforcement issues are handled by state and local authorities and not by the federal government. 
Furthermore, all child support enforcement matters must be addressed at the local or state level before concerns can be raised at the federal level. So just like with what we studied with the Constitution last year when we were reading the actual Constitution, this is a federal level law, but the states are given autonomy in how they execute these laws. Um, and, and the federal level, like the Supre federal Supreme Court, is not going to get involved you know, until the state or the local governments have escalated it to that level. So this is just the raw law, uh, you know, kind of highlighting what the consequences of not fulfilling court order child support is like. Um, next, we'll, we'll go deeper into understanding. Oh, you switched to oolong milk tea. That sounds delicious. You know what? My friend in Germany was streaming on Twitch yesterday, and he was... Uh, enjoying a shoe pour and putting milk and sugar into it uh, and it looked quite decadent oh i should try that sometime i mean we're you know that's that's definitely like a winter time delicacy that i, I get really excited about milk teas you know i think the last time i had milk tea was at um every green jenny when when i went there for noodles way back when i think that was already freaking six or eight months ago fond memories of that meal. That was a good one. I had a beautiful bowl of beef noodle and Hong Kong style milk tea. Oh, you got some matcha from Marie's tea? <laughs> yes, shu pu'er. So now I want, uh, this is a New York Times article that, that we'll look into. Let me just fix the screen so we can all see it. And it's titled, this is New York Times, right? So I, don't, I mean, I don't know what kind of... Oh yeah, you're right, Jenny. There needs to be a mid-autumn festival at Every Grain. That's a great idea. Now that we can all come back together and, and, and be together in gr groups again, I think the timing for that would be great. I'm in full support of that. I'll, uh, I'll serve the tea, no problem. <laughs> all right, so the title of this article is The Child Support System Should Support Families, Not Government Coffers. Okay, so I'm just jumping right in. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time because all of these articles, even though they're making very direct kind of statements uh, and, and arguments uh, for child support reform, uh, th there is going to be laced within these articles how exactly uh, the, uh, the, the state governments will uh, court order child support. So I, I don't want to like double up researching all that stuff when it's already in these articles. So. Um, this is written by Kenneth Braswell. He's an executive director of Fathers Incorporated, a nonprofit organization that promotes responsible fatherhood and mentoring. It says, child support is considered an anti-poverty program because it forces non-custodial parents to contribute financially to their children's care. But it also operates as a government cost recovery strategy by reimbursing states and the federal government for benefits paid to mothers on behalf of children. As such, families on temporary assistance for needy families only receive about a quarter of the child support collected on their behalf. Okay, so that's like a really important, shocking stat right there. You'll be fully vaxxed by the 14th? That's great. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm already a month in. I mean, I did it for my trip to India. Uh, I was not in a hurry to get vaccinated, actually. Um, I'm perfectly fine just to handling my, my own responsibility in this pandemic, but uh, when I started planning the trip to India, I thought it was really important and responsible if I was gonna be going to these uh, different communities that I'd be vaccinated. So I've been vaccinated for over a month now. I haven't really utilized it much. Um, and now that, now that we're on the honor system about vaccination, it makes me wonder, you know, is it even really worth it? But, you know, that's a whole other topic. Maybe we can talk about that uh, next week. You know, I think that could be a good topic for a Constitution Study Group next week. Um, but yeah, 
Yeah, I, you know, I think that the trip to India may be becoming possible soon. Maybe. Uh, you know, the numbers have... They have improved. The countrywide uh, numbers of uh, daily new infective uh, for over the past week, they have been steadily going down, very similar to how our numbers here started going down uh, in February or so. So uh, I'm optimistic that, uh, that I'll be able to, to get over there because I kind of need to. Um, it's just been kind of a mess uh, dealing with everything on this side, coordinating uh, between so many different people, coordinating the, the shipments, just need to go and now that I have you know my my rig for taking the camera and live streaming while I'm there uh, I think there's an opportunity for some really great storytelling uh, not specifically about the pandemic uh, but you know about tea and about the resilience of the communities that are there because um, thank goodness uh, the communities that we work with uh, have remained healthy uh, during this time and, and optimistic. So yeah, I look forward to telling those stories. But it seems like it's kind of troublesome going anywhere. I had heard that Taiwan was gonna be reducing uh, for vaccinated people, was going to be reducing the required quarantine to just a week. Um, but that was requiring a special application, special permission. Uh, which has not become publicly available. That was supposed to happen all a few days ago, and it hasn't yet. So, you know, I don't know uh, the status on that, unfortunately. But yeah, it would be great to go to Taiwan. Um, go, go check out on our friends there, see how they're doing. Because supposedly, uh, life has remained quite normal for them. Um, but, you know, of course, they're not allowing a lot of people to, uh, to go. Oh, your mother-in-law is gonna stay. Yeah, yeah, because I heard it's like, it's like a two week quarantine, but I think you can do it in local housing, uh, which is kind of a relief because the, uh, the hotels, you know, the government sanctioned quarantine hotels. Oh yeah, I saw that recently. Actually, I should check that out. I'll check it out after I finish the stream. I, I wanted to check that because I did hear that there was starting to be a spike in Taiwan. It's strange how this happens, right? Pandemics are really strange. It's like right whenever you think that everything is under control, and I think India is a great example of that because if you look at the spikes that they've had already, they're very minimal. They, they weren't so, you know, affected, but, um, you know, what's, what's being credited to what they're dealing with right now was... Uh, uh, local elections that was having politicians and other political groups organizing large rallies on the streets and because they didn't have such an issue like like we had here um, the mentality around the pandemic was very different um, and then just boom you know you let your guard down and it's in a different place and so that's why I'm like I'm really cautious even as being vaccinated now uh, here with how the, just overnight, I feel like the mentality has changed. You know, the CDC tells you one thing and the whole mentality changes, um, which, you know, knock on wood, it, it's okay, you know? Maybe there was some truly misunderstood intelligence behind uh, that statement by the CDC, uh, just knowing, you know, how pandemics work beyond what I know. So, wishing for the best for us that we don't have to deal uh, you know, more so than just the disease itself, but like all of the lifestyle interruptions and, and market interruptions that have been happening as a result of lockdowns or quarantines or stay at home orders, whatever you want to refer to them as. Okay, so back to child support. Uh, the stat that I thought is really important and that was the stat that really blew my mind about this whole program because before I read this article last week, I thought child support was something that was like independently dealt with in, 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 in civil court. That, you know, uh, a custodial parent 
petition for non-custodial parents to uh, provide financial support. Um, and that is like not true by a long shot. Only 25% of all court ordered child support, that's all child support, be it, you know, through a nasty divorce custody battle in court or through a, an automatically state ordered court ordered child support, only 25% actually can go back to the families themselves. 75% is absorbed by the government. Um, and it, it's not as corrupt as that sounds directly. It's not, it's, it's to pay back other programs. I, how, how did uh, Jay uh, dealt with child support? I don't know. Should I reach out? Should I reach out to Jay? And I'd love to hear some stories. Like I, you know, now that I'm curious about this, I wanna hear stories. Yes, so yeah, uh, thank you for sharing that, Jenny. So Jenny uh, is a small business owner here in Las Vegas, and she just informed us that as an employer, when there's a court order child support, a certain amount of a paycheck has to be held for the government for that. So there's like no getting away from child support. Uh, once the court has ordered it, and, and most of the time, it's like automatically ordered by the court. It's not like from a nasty legal battle, you know, between uh, an ex-wife and an ex-husband. Most of the time, this is the government collecting back on its money, making sure that they get paid. And so that's why uh, I'm gonna become a lot more sensitive now, and a lot more from an advocacy viewpoint now, when I hear people complain, because I've, I've heard this argument a lot, that the, the welfare system is overloaded uh, because people are, are, are having too many babies. You know, they can have a baby and the government will support them and they'll just continue having babies so that they can continue to re receive welfare. Well, uh, the father is going to have to pay that and the government's gonna make sure that they get paid, you know, through the employer or in another article that I'll share through other, you know, parts, which then brings into question systemic problems uh, that that marginalize and oppress particular communities uh, specifically through this this program that's just mind-blowing but only 25% of that child support that you're holding back to give to the government because the government collects it and then the government is supposed to redistribute it to the parent the custodial parent the parent that cares for the child which is usually a mother um, and then the mother can use those funds for health insurance or for food or whatever else is needed for the child support. But only 25% of that money will actually reach it to the, uh, to the families, to the child, to the custodial parent of the child. 75% of it is absorbed by the government and never to be seen by the child again. Though the child has benefited from that money before, either through Medicaid or through other um, like EBT programs, food stamp programs, all those things are always gonna get paid back. The government keeps track of all of that and they're gonna make sure that they always get paid back. And for me, like that was just mind blowing. So the next time I hear someone complain about the welfare system and how people just have children to, um, to exploit it, like no, that is not a valid argument because uh, the government is always gonna make sure that they get the cost recovery strategy, that's what they call it. Hey, Ted. Child support orders are also proportionately very high given many men's low incomes. 70% of the national uncollected child support debt is owed by non-custodial parents who have no quarterly earnings or who have annual earnings of less than $10,000. So it's, yeah, it's a system that disproportionately affects lower income people. Some fathers pay up to 65% of their um, of their wages and child support and it rearranges to the state. So yeah, Jenny, what you're talking about with the, the employer withholding, sometimes it's 65%. So you work and work and work and like the government's just gonna be taking the money anyway and it's not even going to your child. 
it's just going back to the government such a high level of garnishment would severely strain almost any person's budget and drive many low-income men into severe poverty or the underground economy we now know that many low-income fathers want to contribute financially but face barriers including a lack of education and training lack of employment and employment opportunities race and class discrimination criminal records and lack of credentials like a driver's license permanent address and previous work history child support will never reach its full potential for providing income for our most vulnerable families without fundamental changes child support payments should be passed through to the custodial parent in their entirety instead of being used to recoup by uh, government spending on children Payments should be set reasonably with greater flexibility to adjust to the non-custodial parent's income. Fathers can now request a review, but only if they know their rights and can navigate the judicial process, which the majority do not. Fathers need to be armed with the training and skills to compete in this global economy so that they can support themselves and pay child support. Training and employ employment supports can be either mandatory or voluntary, but they should be available. Punitive methods to coerce a deadbeat dad into pain, like incarceration, should only be used in cases where fathers demonstrate that they have the means to pay but are unwilling to fulfill their obligations, not when they are unable to. The Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement itself has said that the average incarcerated parent with a child support case has $10,000 in arrears when entering state prison and leaves with $20,000 in arrears. Not only is this debt unlikely to ever be collected, but it adds to the barriers formerly incarcerated parents face in re-entering their communities. So there, there is interest that, that gets charged to this, and that's you know, one of the reasons why it becomes this continuous cycle that, that they can't get out of. So now knowing this, I don't know about you all, but I just know from my perspective uh, I'm going to have a lot more sympathy, a lot more space uh, for for people that are dealing uh, with this issue. And, uh, you know, do if, if reform is not possible, and I did do some research on reform, uh, such as what uh, the writer of this article was suggesting, is that change needs to be implemented. Um, it's from what I could read reform is not on the horizon there is certainly a movement that there is certainly advocates that are advocating for reform but it doesn't seem to be on the horizon it doesn't seem to be on any for either party for any party's priorities and their platforms uh, it doesn't seem to be something that is likely in the near future so the solution at least from what I think and in, in, in my efforts to be more civilized and my effort to support a stronger community where we can take care of each other I think I you know I think that what what can be done is to um, encourage mothers to be informed on this because at the end of the day if this is an issue of a mother choosing uh, child care so like think about this situation if it's Medicaid right Medicaid is um, for a single mother could be quite feasible to to qualify for and when you're struggling and facing uncertainty facing you know how how the future relationship with the father of that child will be um, it may seem like no questions go down that route because everything is paid for you know medicaid is great when it comes to child care uh, no matter what consequences you have in the delivery of your child everything is going to be taken care of of course because the government wants to make sure that you have a safe pregnancy good um, but women don't know this they don't know that this problem is going to happen because this is going to automatically trigger the state to open up a child support case for the father regardless of her consent or not consent the only place where she actually can have some kind of control in this is if she thoroughly looks at all of the options um, and and makes the right choice and with um, the current 
you know, tax credits and, 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 and uh, medical insurance support that is out there, it is by far a more positive financial decision uh, to, to not take Medicaid. And, you know, if anything, communicate. Communicate with the father of this child about what the options are and what the consequences will be. So both the mother and the father uh, should be educated on this. And that's why I wanted to do this talk today because no one knows their future. Uh, anything can happen. And so the best thing that we can do is just constantly be aware of what all of our options are and you know, what is possible because, you know, like I, I've read several other op-eds on this topic. There's a lot on it. This is not an underground thing. Like this is very well known. Lots of people are advocating for this and talking about this. And a, a lot of criticisms that I've seen about this system is that it tears families apart. And I get that. It's like, of course, money tears people apart. Money creates conflict. And so it may be very scary to approach your partner, uh, approach the father of your child to reason with them and, 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 and come up with some type of resolution that would help with the well being of your child. That can be very scary. And that, that could bring fear that it'll negatively impact your relationship with that person and ultimately the relationship of that person with your child who, who is their father, in most cases the father. But if you like even unintentionally, unknowingly force a father into this system into this systemic oppressive cyclical system unknowingly because I bet you most women that 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 do end up getting into the system of, of collecting child support they didn't even intend to do it they didn't even know what they were doing they just thought oh well free medical care food stamps great this will support my family not knowing that that was going to turn into something that could you know create a lifelong cycle of incarceration for the father of their child, that will tear a family apart, like for sure, for sure. No matter how much love is there, no matter how much support and caring is there, and it could all be completely unintentional, completely unknowing that that you you've done that. Um, so yeah, it's very important uh, to to explain these options, and so I do encourage you all since you are all educated and knowing on this that um you know if, if uh you do interact with with young mothers uh or even young people that aren't even mothers yet and just let them be aware of this it could be very powerful uh in helping someone's life and helping uh, a family's relationship it could be very powerful because it doesn't look as if reform is anywhere Coming. probably in the future you know at least reform to the like cut dry because the first the first article I shared with you it was an article this was coming from the Department of Justice website federal government's website it's very black or white if you don't pay your child support after one year it's a misdemeanor if you don't pay it after two years or if it collects up to ten thousand dollars that's a felony you're going to jail Right, and there's like there are some things in here that said in certain in certain circumstances. I don't know what those are. From what I've seen online and in like people sharing their firsthand accounts of this, like there's never any circum certain circumstances. It's all or nothing, um, and people don't even know this. People don't even know it. And you know, like I've heard too that uh, states, because they want to recoup their costs. Yes, Kayla. Yes, Kayla. You have that absolutely correct. <laughs> and that's un unknowing. I mean, Kayla, you're a very intelligent uh, young woman. 
But you, you, even, even, you know, like, I didn't know this. I read this last week, and I was like, what? This is crazy. This is super crazy. And um, here's the other crazy stat. This is an important stat that, like, blew my mind in this whole thing. Of all the child support, and all child support is collected by the state. Even if it's like state triggered, even if it's automatically triggered by, by medical assistance, like uh, government medical assistance, like you uh, asked there, but even if it's like through like a divorce court and like custody battle, the, the child support is still gonna be collected itself by the government and then distributed to the um, custodial parent. Um, and uh, of all of that money, only 25% of that money actually reaches to the family, to the child, to the custodial parent of the child. 75% of it is held by the government to like recoup costs uh, from these like uh, public medical assistance programs, Medicaid, uh, as well as food stamps, EBT, and in certain states, even WIC, even, even like milk and cheese that's given to, to, to mothers and children uh, it'll all be kept tabs of and the government will make sure that they get paid back on all of it and that will be a debt that will stick with the father in most cases it's the father it'll stick with him for life yes child support pays for food stamps yes yeah yeah so you know like I was saying earlier if I ever hear the argument again uh, of somebody, I'm not going to say what type of person would make this argument, but I have heard this argument that uh, women take advantage of the welfare system by having children, because yes, the government's going to make sure that you have a healthy pregnancy that you are cared for. Uh, they're going to make sure of that, um, but they're also going to make sure that they get paid back on it, and more than likely, they won't get paid back but they will put that father into a continuous cycle of incarceration. It's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. So, um, and this article kind of talks more about this. It's, it's titled Criminalizing Poor Fatherhood. Um, you know, in that the, the stereotype of the deadbeat father um, is so skewed because it's perpetuated by this system. It's, it's supported and perpetuated by this system. So, you know, I think that like, oh, oh, oh. And then here's something else that a lot of states have started to do because they do want to make sure that these funds get reimbursed for, for these social programs. Um, the pater uh, what do they call that? Uh, paternizing children, uh, like uh, assigning parenthood to children is really important to states. And I've heard that they've started to use genetic database information so like um, 23andMe and, and those types of like programs where you send in your your spit I think you give them your spit and then they give you like a genetic readout of like where you're from what your ethnicity or not your ethnicity but your um, your uh, your genetics are from but those are databases. Those are like extremely valuable, uh, controversial databases uh, that um, you know the governments are using to solve crimes. I heard about this, but now they're even using it to assign parent, like assign fatherhood to children, uh, so that they know who to go after for child support. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. It affects so many people. So here's a, a story. Um, unpaid child support is having an impact on someone. The support has been paid in full to the state that it is owed, but the current state they live in is not receiving the update. It's impacting a potential mortgage. Yeah, so that affects your credit and also your criminal record, right? Because after two years, the, the federal law it says, if it's uh, proven to be unpaid after one year, it's a misdemeanor. If it's proven to be unpaid after two years, it's a, it's a felony. Yeah, of course the offices aren't communicating with each other, it's states. So, uh, and the states, like, they, they make it very clear, the federal government, I should say, not just the states, but the federal government, they make it very clear that you can't 
you can't change states to avoid this problem. You know, they're, they're going to find you. But I hope I hope this gets resolved for your friend because I know it's a yeah it's an issue it's an issue and you know even if the child support is like fully ordered through a a civil trial directly between the two parents so like not state ordered not triggered by you know state benefits programs but literally you know a mother asking for child support to help pay for health insurance and food and other supplies needed in the house. Um, you would think 100% of the child support would go to the mother, but uh, depending on the states, there are fees. And you have to pay child support fee to the state for handling that. So, um, you know, another reason to maintain civilized relationships uh, because, yeah, the exchange of value and financial support, I'm sure no father wants to deny that. But once the state starts getting involved and these fees start getting involved and the potentiality of your, your criminalization gets involved, it's, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, the ultimate thing that hurts is the child because that affects the relationship. Um, you know, not only between the father and the, 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 the mother, but, you know, just like the father and the institution of fatherhood in this country, you know? So, um, yeah, my, my, from going forward, you know, like I'm just going to advocate a lot for this, especially for young people, people thinking about having children, especially if they're unmarried. Now, if you're married... The situation's a lot different. Uh, this this really uh, does come to affect unmarried parents a lot because that's when um, you know mothers tend to to reach out for these government programs. Hi, Don. Good to see you. Thanks for stopping by and saying hello. We're talking about uh, a pretty controversial topic today. Uh, the The purpose of this is just to educate, just to make aware. Um, because uh, I think it's information that not a lot of people uh, think about, talk about, because frankly, you know, like it, for a lot of people, this seems like such a faraway problem, um, but it is a, a real, real problem. Here's a story. Here's a story. This is actually an academic article that was published in the university, I don't know what UA is, uh, but it's it's from their law school. So this, this is a, an article from... A law program. Yeah, Brian. So Brian says when the state gets involved, sometimes even the parents' voice can be dismissed. So that's that's so true. That's so true. So like, even if you are in some type of disagreement with your partner or with the the father or the mother of your child, try your best to keep it out of the court. Try your best uh, because. Yeah, then you, you lose your your own advocacy uh, in that in that conflict, or even in that resolution, you know. So it really fucking sucks. Like I, it's it's understandable the government wants to come in and assure that every child is taken care of and their well being is 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 secured. That that is like duh, but um, but yeah, this is a hairy thing, and I've never heard it on any politician's platform, either for reform or support. So it's kind of like this thing that, that's there and, and lawmakers really don't want to touch it or deal with it, um, even though there's plenty of advocacy out there saying that that system's broken. So the best thing that we can do is be proactive. The best thing that we can do is try to protect our own rights and, and look out for our friends and, and community members so that they don't get wrapped up um, into these things. On April 4th, 2015, Walter Scott was pulled over in North Charleston, South Carolina for driving with a broken tail light. As most people know by now, Mr. Scott fled on foot and was ultimately shot in the back by the police officer who pulled him over. Why did Mr. Scott run? 
According to his family, Mr. Scott owed over $18,000 in child support. He missed a court date related to his failure to pay the child support and a warrant issued. His brother says he ran because he did not want to have to spend more time behind bars and face the loss of, a, of another job as a result of his failure to pay and the subsequent warrant. Every job he has had, he has gotten fired from because he went to jail because he was locked up for child support. He got to the point where he felt like it defeated the purpose. Subsequent to Mr. Scott's death, the child support system stayed on the public radar for a short period of time. But the concerns about the system raised by Mr. Scott's death have faded. Police departments have continued to make sweeps for deadbeat parents, and legislatures have pushed through new laws that further curtail the options available for a parent with outstanding child support obligations. Even non-legislative agencies have promulgated punitive policies. For example, the Texas Attorney General recently implemented a new measure prohibiting a parent with a delinquent child support obligation from renewing his car registration. The ever-present threat of criminal prosecution and incarceration looms large for parents who simply cannot afford to pay their outstanding child support obligations, trapping men of little or no means in a cycle of debt, unemployment, and imprisonment. Increasing numbers of parents, primarily fathers, are prosecuted, prosecuted and incarcerated for failing to pay child support. Although national data is not kept, at least one source asserts that about 50,000 people are incarcerated in the United States for this offense. Another study out of South Carolina found that one in eight of those incarcerated in county jails were there for failure to pay. One out of eight. You know, like, and, and the, the criminal justice system is meant to protect us from crime, right? One out of eight. Yeah, one out of eight. But Brian, um, yeah, you're right. It is unfair. I mean, sometimes the mothers don't even want the child support. It's like, yeah, I've already remarried and I'm financially secure. I don't even need this child support. And the father is still obligated. And that's because of these like black and light, black and white lines that are drawn in the system versus really holistically trying to restore the relationships here. Like that should be the ultimate goal on this is not only making sure that finances are covered and everybody is secure and, and taken care of, but we gotta protect the relationships because that's what's going to really affect the future outcome of that child's life if they have a healthy relationship with their father. Yeah, it happens a lot, and then and then the father becomes a criminal. So the fatherhood becomes criminalized, and and this is significantly staggered towards low income communities, which was just so happened to coincide with you know people of color. Go figure how how that makes sense, but um, it's sad. It's really sad. Uh, not to say that this is not a problem that affects all type of people, but uh, it does significantly affect um, mostly black men, um, although all, all you know, people of color. In Georgia, 3,500 parents were incarcerated for outstanding child support obligations in a single year. An estimated one quarter of inmates in federal or state prison have an open child support case. So yeah, one out of eight is like they, that was their crime, was child support, nothing else. But of all prisoners, one quarter have. So, you know, they may have been incarcerated for something else, but that time that they are in prison, obviously they're not working, they're not paying child support. And those child supports, they do accumulate interest. And so then you get out of prison and, you know, it's already been spoke on over and over again. I think there's no mystery 
around this that someone who is recently out of prison has a great struggle not only reassimilating into society but just like getting job period right so they get out and they're struggling to pay back and uh, if they get a legit job like a real tax job like we would hope them to get the employer is automatically going to take that money out from them they won't even have the choice of like getting back on their feet because as Jenny mentioned earlier um, as an employer she's had to take money out of people's paychecks assigned for child support so I, yeah I've read some horror stories of people just getting out of prison they're lucky enough to find a job but then don't get any of their that money because it's all just going back to to pay back the back child support and so what's that going to do that's going to get you to to hate the system you know and, and potentially even hate the institution of fatherhood which is like no don't do that like that's the worst thing that we want because that affects the relationship with the child but it it, it encourages people to dig themselves deeper into a criminal lifestyle because you know your criminal lifestyle is not filing your pay stubs with the government and, and collecting automatically collecting your your unpaid child support crazy crazy and all this done in the name of civility you know which is understandable but you know, we just like like I said, I think the only thing that we really can do, actionable thing that we can do, is inspire ourselves, educate ourselves, and help inspire and educate the ones around us uh, to be proactive um, in dealing with these. Yeah, I'm sure in Albuquerque, there's a lot of stories there. Brian says. Um, Yeah, I wonder what this, what's going to be coming of that, you know, people that aren't. Um, Bitcoin, you want to come say hi? Come here, buddy. Yeah, Bitcoin, you don't have to worry about child support, boy. They took care of that at the vet a long time ago. <laughs> Bitcoin, Bitcoin don't have no babies out there. That's a good thing. All states have civil mechanisms to enforce child support orders, but increasingly states are relying on criminal sanctions to remedy a parent's failure to pay child support. This situation is untenable for several reasons, two of which are discussed in more detail in this article. First, poor fathers are being incarcerated for not having the money to support their children. These prosecutions not only violate the constitution, but also uh, contravene the prohibition of debtors prisons. Poor fathers are being punished for incarceration for not having the money to support their children. Second, and even more troubling from an institutional perspective, fathers with little to no income are helping finance the government's child support enforcement system. Federal law requires custodial parents who receive state assistance to assign their child support payments to the state. Thus, any child support payment by the non-custodial parent will go straight to the government as reimbursement. For the state assistance it has provided to the custodial parent. If the father does not pay the child support as ordered, even when the failure is due to insufficient income on which to live and pay the debt, the government punishes the fathers with criminal charges or possible incarceration for not reimbursing the cost of the state assistance. In other words, poor fathers are being criminally sanctioned and incarcerated for failing to finance the government's welfare programs and child support system despite their inability to do so. <laughs> you like the Bitcoin reaction video? That was that was fun. Bitcoin's gonna be making a lot more of those types of videos. Yeah, the guy, the guy, uh, the original poster of that video, his name is Andrew Fox. He is a, uh, he does um, like Broadway musical. Uh, he's been in that industry for 20 years, I think he said. 
Uh, so he posts a lot about like music theory and, and music. Um, uh, but he does get involved in like civil rights and advocating for various perspectives to help us better understand our civil rights, um, which I appreciate that he uses his platform for that. Um, and yeah, he, uh, he used his platform to talk about decolonizing tea, which I was just like, yes. Um, and uh, I was chatting with him this morning and hoping, yeah, we'll get to do some collaboration, um, you know, and expand that education. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to see that he's interested in that topic because there's not a lot of resources available for that subject. Um, you know, there's that one article, I don't know if you've read that article, the link that's on the bottom of that React video, uh, bit.ly slash decolonize T. That is a very thorough article article uh, about this subject, but there's just not a whole lot on it. Um, you know, and, and another thing that I think is really curious, and I'm like, seeking out the best methods to open this Pandora's box of sorts um, around decolonizing tea is that the conversation of colonizing tea a lot of times for good reason is focused on the British <laughs> the British method of of, uh, of of tea culture and how the British and the Europeans were responsible for colonizing tea, which is true. Uh, but I think there's other levels and other layers of colonization that are often overlooked. Um, uh, you know, such as the question of, um, you know, you think about the original places where tea was, and we're talking about thousands of years ago, um, even up until some hundred years ago, some, I don't have the exact date, that's why I say some hundreds of years ago, I don't know the exact date of it, because uh, uh, frankly not a lot of this has gotten published because it would you know, threaten the current net, n uh, narrative, and you know, nothing I love doing more than questioning questioning the narrative uh, but um, that like the the places of origin of tea the original places of origin of tea which you know I've spent a good amount of time in those places uh, getting to know the people getting to know the tea and uh, seeing the reverence that there like feeling it you can feel the reverence that's there you can feel the lineage between the people there and, and the, the tea trees there. It feels very different than the other tea cultures that I've been exposed to, including my own tea culture. I definitely, I, I cannot claim any kind of lineage uh, to tea myself. I am just a student trying to learn. Um, but that, oh, that doesn't get talked about. And the one time I did talk about it, the one time I brought validation to that, um, and it wasn't through Yunnan, it wasn't through Guizhou, it wasn't through any province in China where you got these 3,000 year old tea trees. This was in India, you know, and that's what really blew my mind. It was like, I'm feeling this lineage, not even in China, it's in India, and this is valid. Like, I don't understand it, but I want to document it and I want to tell this story. And I think through telling that story and giving it a voice will help stimulate what needs to happen next uh, which you know will complete that narrative and give us a more full picture of the lineage of tea and who's colonized it or not colonized it and how we can restore those lineages and also support the evolution of the culture right because in, in decolonizing things it doesn't mean that we just want to take it back to its roots it means we want to respect those lineages allow them to continue but then also support an evolution of of, of new lineages of, of new culture and you know the response that i got from the uh dictators of the narrative that's not valid 
don't say that story. It's not valid. Like, someone literally used that word. They use the word not valid. Uh, and I, you know, like, it's been years since that happened. And I felt very defeated when that happened. But now I'm feeling like the time is coming, you know, when someone like him, somebody who's not a tea professional, someone who is a musician that's just um, a social media creator, uh, you know, trying to tell the stories around culture, when someone like him starts to notice the concepts of de decolonizing a product such as tea, uh, you know, I, I feel like it, it opens up an opportunity uh, for this storytelling to really happen. <laughs> Someone on TikTok named Carrot Cake just joined. I love that name. Thanks, Carrot Cake. Thanks for joining in. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's, that's a good one. Yeah, I just, I had to do it, that video, and I look forward to learning with him more and bringing the right people. Like, I, I feel like Ray from Grass People Tree in London. Uh, she is from Guizhou. Uh, she grew up there and um, now she's in London uh, experiencing, you know, that culture uh, and then paralleling that to what she grew up with and, you know, some of the cultural challenges that she's experienced in her own community. I think she's the perfect voice to amplify for this. Yeah, something been going on with my, my mouse lately. So for, for those that weren't at my gaming stream yesterday, you know, I've Tuesday nights I've been dedicating to gaming. Oh, look at that precious little boy. Can you imagine this deadbeat, this deadbeat father paying his child support? <laughs> Bitcoin, Bitcoin's on the screen. He's just passed out. He's such a cutie. Yeah, the gaming stream yesterday was kind of a bust. Um, the game is extremely buggy. Uh, you know, it had good potential the first day I played it. There were some fun moments. Um, but yeah, things were just not lining up the way that uh, they should have. And then came to realize that there was there's just straight up bugs in the game. Um, and then so, I thought that maybe it was because I'm streaming the game from my PC and then to my iMac where I'm sending it out for the stream for you all. But um, so I thought, okay, let me go home and play the game on my PC only. And so I did that and it didn't help. Still had the same bugs and the same problems going on. So. It's the game itself, so I think by next week I'm gonna look for a new game to play. <laughs> and next week's Constitution Study Group, I think, um, you know, someone had brought it up earlier, the concept of the, um, you know, the CDC, so like the constitutionality of um, CDC recommendations, uh, particularly in regards to the current mask uh, honor system. Um, yeah, you might want to look into that, deeper into that. Hi, Marco, good to see you, good to see you, happy Wednesday talking about a subject today that I hope you never have any, any kind, I hope no one ever has any kind of negative um, interactions with the child support system, but it's a very serious one, and 
you know, I've, I've pretty much have finished already going over all the articles, but uh, just a little recap because I think it's important for all of us to be educated on this, like really freaking important, especially if we want to be like anti-racist and empowering to marginalized communities. Really important to know this. If a mother receives state supported, state supplied financial support, healthcare support, Medicaid, food stamps, these types of things, if the mother receives this on behalf of a child, the state will automatically trigger a court ordered child support order for the father that will be attached to him for the rest of his life. And it does accumulate interest. You cannot run away from it if you try to go to a different state. And even in this, in, in this time, people uh, try to uh, not claim fatherhood um, and uh, even if the mother doesn't put the father's name on the birth certificate uh, with uh, databases of genetic information, it is possible for states to assign fatherhood to somebody even if they try to remain anonymous and they will collect to reimburse those state-supported financial programs. Um, that's a problem. And where it becomes a problem is that it mis- uh, it, uh, it targets, you know, lower income men in particular um, and puts them into cycles of incarceration and, and criminalization. Federal government says that if you do not pay for one year, it becomes a misdemeanor. If you don't pay for two years, it becomes a felony. Uh, one out of eight men in prison are there because of this. And 25% uh, of of, of people in prison have some type of child support account that is unpaid. Um, so the longer they're in prison, they can't pay it, and they come out and they try to work, and, and employers are uh, mandated to hold on to child support payments. So a lot of times there's no way around it, and it really only encourage, encourages um, people to go deeper into a criminal lifestyle. So. Uh, the advocacy that we can all do is to educate people around us to know about this uh, and, and help each other out because, you know, as long as you don't get the state involved in financial assistance when it comes to a child, you can avoid this, um, you know, and so that supports healthy relationships between parents, healthy relationships between fathers and children, which is good, um, but it's a big problem and it's like a, it's one of those pieces of that nasty systemic racism uh, that we're trying to address. And reform for this does not look as if it's on the horizon. So the only thing that we can do is advocate for uh, proactive education. Um, yeah, because if you crunch the numbers, you may end up finding out that it may cost a little bit more money up front for parents to pay for their own private insurance uh, and, and medical care um, to avoid Medicaid, because I think that's like a big part of it is Medicaid. You know, women get on Medicaid because it's a very easy, uh, very supportive way of the government to support your pregnancy. Uh, but they, they do expect to get paid back. Um, and and uh, this is not like public knowledge. It's not like, I mean, maybe it is for certain people, especially people that have dealt in the system, but it wasn't knowledge to me. And I think it's something important. Uh, to make people aware of. Um, so yeah, let's support strong, good families. Uh, let's not criminalize fatherhood. It's a sad, oh man, so many sad stories we read about today. So, so sad. Perpetual cycles of, of debt and, and criminalization because of, of child support. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not trying to advocate that, that you know, monogamy or marriage is a solution because th there's problems in any, in any place. But uh, the only solution with this, with no reform on the horizon, is just for, for families to be aware of this and to try to make proactive decisions that will benefit, positively benefit their, their child's future versus um, just assuming. And gosh darn it, if I heard one more person complain that women exploit the welfare system by having more children. I mean, this completely negates all of that. So, cheers to being civilized.
how you been? I hope you've been well. I've been keeping up with your work. We're going to be doing, uh, I was talking about it a little bit earlier, we're going to be doing as part of the next virtual tea festival a decolonizing tea workshop with Ray and um, Charlene. Charlene is the one that wrote that article, um, you know, it's time to decolonize tea. Um, so I look forward, I look forward to opening these conversations, sensitive conversations, but important ones, extremely important. shared all the downer news <laughs> but uh, the positive news is that there are a lot of people uh, that, that want to be great parents that are raising beautiful children oh what am I drinking today actually Don this is interesting what I'm drinking today thanks for asking me uh, I'm not drinking my typical my typical fare I'm actually not even drinking tea today I'm drinking an herbal blend it is uh, cedar peppermint Passion flower, chamomile, very relaxing. Oh, and pop, uh, a poppy, California poppy uh, leaf. Nice blend. This is coming from uh, Joe. You know, Joe. Joe hangs out with us in tea talks uh, sometimes. He's busy. He's been busy lately. He hasn't been hanging out too much. Uh, but uh, Joe has a business called Sage and Cedar uh, Herbal Wellness out of South Dakota, Black Hills. Yeah, uh, he, uh, he sources tea through our platform, but uh, he sources all of his herbs, so like what goes into this blend uh, from local organic farms in his area. Yeah, so this is called slumber. Everything in here is pretty calming. Pretty calming. So yeah, I've been... I didn't want to get myself on edge talking about this topic, so... <laughs> wanted to drink something calming. Calming and relaxing. I saw you've been drinking tea, Don. That's good for you. I'm happy to see you're still drinking tea. I mean, why wouldn't you, right? No reason to stop. No reason ever. Tomorrow we should have uh, a nice time hanging out in the uh, virtual tea space. And then Friday is International Tea Day, which is uh, a holiday. Um, the UN, so the UN has actually taken over it. So there's probably going to be a lot of different programming going on. I know a few different things. so. Um, I don't know, I, I decided not to create any programming on that day just because I want to support the programming that's already out there. But um, I'll talk about it on my stream. I think it's important, you know, I think there's a lot of misinterpretation around what International Tea Day is about. Uh, for the most part, you're going to see a lot of tea marketing and tea brands using it as an opportunity to to sell tea, to romanticize the tea lifestyle, but actually, and you know, now since the UN has taken over the holiday, um, you know, they're they're being a lot more proactive in letting the world know that it's actually a holiday that is uh, for observing and celebrating um, the communities behind tea, the communities that make tea. 
specifically the marginalized communities, which if you hang out enough at this channel, you'll know. You'll know that uh, there is no shortage of marginalized communities in tea. You know, the last time I was in India, there was a lot of very interesting commercials for tea. <laughs> I thought, you know what, it's actually good. You know, even though the commercials aren't my, my favorite, but I think it's good because it's helping introduce a new perspective around the tea lifestyle for um, the Indian community, which for so long, and, 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 and going to be for so long, chai is the backbone um, of not just Indian tea culture, but just like Indian culture in general, right? Um, but it's not just tea, you know, it's so much more than just tea. It's satiation, it's um, decadence, it's comfort. Um, and uh, the new commercials that I The new commercials that I've been seeing. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, of course, sexualized women. Go figure. Uh, the new commercials that I've been seeing about um, about tea in India are promoting green tea. The, the Indian tea brands have been trying to create a, a, a domestic market for green tea as a health product. And um, it's like really obvious. This uh, showing, showing people like trying to get rid of their stomach fat. And it's like, you know, they just start drinking these green tea tea, ba tea bags and Magically, their belly goes away. Again, see, not the type of commercial. That I would typically support for tea culture. But, it's a step in the direction. You know, kind of like why there's gratitude for a lot of us, uh, among a lot of us, for, for brands like Tivana. You know, they definitely weren't selling the type of tea that, that we would like to see here, uh, but it was like that baby step to, to get us to where we want to go. So yeah, green tea is becoming popular in India now, but it's, it's mostly, you know, under this guise that it's gonna help you get rid of your belly fat. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting that they chose, I'll have to look up some commercials. Is it specifically for International Tea Day? It's interesting that they chose Chinese women. Yeah, and those commercials were not trying to be subtle. Like, it was like, you know, somebody really struggling with their belly fat. <laughs> I'll look it up. I'll look up the commercial. Actually, maybe I'll look it up right now. Oh, YouTube. Always have everything we need. Dang, there's a lot of International Tea Day commercials. Oh, 
you saw it on Facebook. Yeah, please, please tag me. I'd like to see that. Last year, you know, the programming that I uh, spent my most time on, you know, I know the Tea Association in Canada did some programming, long programming. Um, I found the, uh, the programming from the UN to be really great, actually. They live stream, you know, this conference that they had. I'm sure they'll be doing it again, so... Um, I'll be sharing that to all of our socials so everybody gets to see it. Yeah, I'm not seeing it on YouTube, just under a quick search. <laughs> Brian, yeah. Hey, I didn't say that I agreed with all of Timana's practices, but... <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, like, uh, you've got to say thank you where, you know, where there is even limited gratitude to be had. <laughs> so I'm going to check if the UN um, has a program this year. did work for them, Don? Oh, you were flattered they wanted you to work for them, yeah. Also, there will be a programming. Oh, I guess not. Dang, they just blew it all last year. the UN has a pretty cool website here I'll show it to you has a pretty cool website um, for it but yeah it doesn't look like they have a program so they have last year's one harnessing the benefits from all for, for all from field to cup I had watched that and then they did another one I didn't see this one T for sustainable D development Hello, this video. happy International Tea Day. My name is John Snell and I have been privileged to be working with the FAO and EBRD on a review of the Georgian and Azerbaijan tea sectors. My job in this is to assess quality and suggest remedial actions if at all required. I look at five different characteristics for tea. Brightness in colour first of all, does it look like a good cup of tea? Thirdly, flavour. Once I taste it, does it live up to the promise of the appearance? Hi, Fourthly, Shiloh. body. That's viscosity, but really is the promoter of positive qualities of tea. And finally, astringency, which delivers positive bite at the front end and allows the flavor to linger long after you've swallowed the tea. Happy International Tea Day. Goodbye. I don't know, Jon Snow. Sorry, don't agree. But, you know, it was a good try. We got to decolonize tea first, and then we can get somewhere. <laughs> That's the first step, so... Uh, yeah, Brian, I saw the article you sent me. That's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. Yeah, don't let your crypto your crypto value be known or else the, the state's going to try to collect it for your child support. y'alls I'm gonna go today has been a productive great conversation thank you all for allowing this space for it to happen I know the topic of child support is not something easy and um, 
you know, but let's let's have more empathy and, uh, you know, educate our neighbors. It's really important. Let your neighbors know, um, you know, that, that child support and love for your child is best dealt with outside of the court. <laughs> yeah, for several reasons. But um, I'm going to head out now. one person here on uh, oh bye Kayla thanks for hanging out Kayla let me see is, okay well I'll say bye to all of you all thank you so much for hanging out we'll see you tomorrow and uh, I'm gonna see if there's someone that we can raid since I've got you here Kayla we can go raid somebody Tef was on our online earlier. I would have loved to have raided him because um, he has like a new raid alert that when he gets raided, like this like Topia window pops up. You know, of all the Topies dancing in the heart tea room. <laughs> it's sweet. It's sweet. But um, yeah, so I'm just going to sign off today and I'll see everybody tomorrow in the Topia tea house. Have a great evening. Be well, rest well.